you for your very, very kind introduction. I would very much like to have it in writing for further purposes. <laughs> May I first of all really say how pleased I am to be here. Something that I have not told even the ambassador here is that I do have an Irish connection. My son-in-law has an Irish father. So that's an additional reason. And whenever I go and meet them, they live outside London, I hear a lecture about what's going on in this country. I'm really happy to be here this time in, in order to share with you some views on the more recent Finnish domestic politics. It was customary to say for a very long time that politics in Finland is a great bore because nothing happens. Uh, every government is more or less behaving in a way as if they were civil servants rather than politicians, that there is no political life at all. That, that, that was a very common complaint. Not so today. I would also like to pay tribute to those who chose the title for my speech. Uh, a little bit of sarcastic humor in it, and I can very well live with that. Well, our offense through Europeans. If previous record is, uh, meaning, uh, is of any importance, we should really say that we are true Europeans. We have been so for a very long time, and uh, from, from the beginning of 1995, as we joined it, we had an aim to be as much as possible in the core of the Union. History is my university background, and that is perhaps the reason why I tend to approach today, things of today, through the lens of history. Because you won't understand what is going on today unless you knew what happened yesterday. Both of our countries are, in a way, in a periphery, in a geographic sense, not in any other sense, but in a purely geographic sense, we are in a periphery. Uh, seen, say, from Berlin or from Rome or those kind of, kinds of places. And that, of course, to some degree at least, uh, uh, brings us closer in our approaches. We fence were for a very long time outside the main roads of European integration during the Cold War. And the decision to join the European Union was therefore a very momentous decision. During the Cold War, we had bridged, uh, built bridges into Western Europe in various ways. And the single most important direction from the war years onwards was our very close cooperation with the Scandinavian countries as a, in, as a region. The, the participation was very easy because our cultures are very similar. Our political systems are almost identical. The fact that there are, two, uh, 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 that there are three monarchs in the area doesn't really mean that they would be very much monarchical in their political life. So our political cultures are close. And uh, that makes our cooperation easy. Scandinavian countries had a Schengen of their own 30 years before the Union did, a passport union, which made travel the same thing as domestic travel. And we had, have had a common labor market since 1954, which again is much earlier than anybody dreamt of in, in, this, in, in, in the rest of Europe. All social services are extended to the citizens uh, uh, the five countries uh, uh, since 1956. So from that uh, angle again, this region is a very particular region in the degree of its uh, integration. Uh, the European Free Trade Association was founded in 1960 and Finland uh, joined it one year later. Among the original member, members were Britain, uh, Sw Sweden, Denmark, and Norway, plus Austria, Portugal, and Switzerland. Uh, in other words, the European neutrals of the day, except Ireland, were members of EFTA. 
And the difference between EFTA and AEC was mainly in the fact that EFTA was strictly and only a free trade area, whereas the EEC had from the very beginning also political goals. So the, because its orig origins were different from the coal and steel union onwards. EFTA was in a way an association of those who were not prepared to enter into political cooperation. And uh, that made it appealing to the European neutrals. Finland having in those days uh, the Soviet Union as our main trading partner, had also a country which from time to time uh, felt the cold Siberian winds blowing our way. We were in no position even to contemplate the idea of joining EEC in, in, in those days. The matter of fact that uh, uh, although the European Union is not, at least yet, a military uh, alliance, uh, nevertheless, membership it, in it meant for us a political association with a group of states with similar values and simi similar goals, and therefore it meant some sort of a political guarantee rather than a military guarantee to our independence. There were several arguments which were of an economic nature to join the European Union. Uh, but there were others against it. Uh, and um, from the political viewpoint, really the fact that we were now in company with the other de European democracies was of decisive importance. The Finnish public opinion at the time when we were preparing ourselves for the negotiation was pretty much divided almost evenly divided, those for, for, those against. And uh, if you ask what were the arguments of those who were against, one, one could simply say that um, they were not very different from any other countries in Europe which contemplated membership at one time. S similar discussions took place in, in many instances. In a study uh, which was made uh, before our membership, uh, comparing Norwegian and Swedish debates on, on the issue sh showed that their worries were pretty much similar to ours. The Danish case, of course, was rather different because Denmark made their decision much earlier than, than we did ours. But similar arguments were raised there too about independence, about, about uh, national culture, about uh, the system of government and so on. Many Finns felt that we are somewhat superior in uh, certain areas. Uh, and our standards are more demanding than those of the Union. But after membership, we noticed that we had been exaggerating. That was not really the case. We were pretty much in line. And in some instances, we had to improve our own performance in order to meet the requirements. So, so this uh, self-confidence, self-congratulatory confidence was uh, perhaps uh, somewhat overstated. So many of the arguments against were more about feelings rather than facts. But feelings in politics are just as important as facts. Agriculture uh, was, of course, like in so many other countries, a very major problem in those days. Not that it would constitute a large part of the economy, only about 1% of our GDP comes from agriculture, although it employs about 3% of, of the labor force. But agriculture has, in Finland, like in many European countries, a very powerful lobby. They are the best organized lobby, and uh, they have much at stake. Finland being a large country, in land area the same as Britain, uh, has a population of 5.3 million, but three quarters of them live in less than one quarter of the country in the south. And the rest of the country pretty much has lived on agriculture. This is no longer the case, but the mentality is that of a farming society, even today in many places. Although they do not really win their bread through farming, they still 
have emotionally a very cl close and strong attachment to the value of a farmer community. And farmers, of course, were very much afraid of joining the European Union because they did know that the system of various uh, supports that we had on a national level would be abolished and we would have to settle for a European system and, and farmers widely thought that this would be uh, less favorable to farmers than, than the national system had been. Now we have somewhat of a mix and most farmers nowadays believe that membership in the European Union is in their own advantage. They, they do understand that uh, having common goals with farmers of other countries in Europe may be in their best interest. But as I said, emotionally, things are still difficult for them in, in the process of integration. We joined then in 1995 and we had before that a referendum where 54% voted in favor. And, I, and that, was, that was a clear case. Sweden came a few weeks later with a somewhat slighter margin. But although the referendum was only an advisory one, it was in fact politically binding because the parliament would not go against it and nor did it want to go against it because the political class was much more favorable towards membership than the majority of the voters. Now why am I telling you all this in such great detail? Well, uh, what was true 16 years ago largely still is true. The Finnish farmers uh, and their children and, and uh, uh, people around them still feel the same way that although it is in their economic interest in be in the Union, it works against their emotional way of seeing the world. Among those who were opposed uh, to the membership, uh, one argument that was, what was raised is that as soon as we are members, we have an influx of uh, immigrants uh, in very large numbers. And the trade union movement uh, published a report according to which the day we join the European Union, we will have some 300,000 immigrants the first year. Uh, now, what really happened is we're speaking about hundreds, not hundreds of thousands the first year. Now the, the numbers are, are, are somewhat bigger. Estonians today constitute the largest uh, foreign-born element in Finland, uh, and the Russians all, are almost of the same size. But for Estonians, it is very easy to come to Finland because culturally we are close enough and even the languages are not all that different. The fears that people would come in great numbers from tropical countries uh, were proven to be uh, quite naive. <laughs> I mean, it's true that last week we had in Helsinki 30 degrees, but so did we in winter, minus 30 degrees. Uh, so, so this is a good barrier against unwanted immigration. Uh, and if we add to that the fact that our immigration policies and immigration bureaucracy is not exactly inviting, all that uh, explains it why the numbers are among the smallest in Europe for the time being. In the early days of our membership, we had a government led by the chairman of the Social Democratic Party, Mr. Paavo Lipponen. And he was prime minister for two consecutive terms or eight years. As a prime minister and party leader, he was and still is, is but no longer a party leader, no prime minister, but is a deeply believing European. And I use the word believing advisedly. He really does think that uh, our proper place is in the heart of the European Union and that it is in our very best interest to do everything we can to stay there. Now, we had elections this year in mid-April. Before the elections, in the public opinion polls, 
it became rather evident already pretty early, about half a year before, that a party which used to have six members in the parliament of 200 was likely to gain good many more. Uh, as soon as uh, politicians became more or less convinced that this is going to be the case, they started to analyze uh, the public, public opinion, uh, shall we say, prevailing winds, and they came to the conclusion that one of the reasons why this new party is uh, likely to gain very many more seats is its uh, rather, shall we say, reluctant policy towards the European Union, a policy where all evil comes from Brussels, where uh, the, the fact that we have the euro was a great mistake. Uh, Sweden does not have the euro, and their economy fares even better than ours. So that was the proof for them that euro was not a blessing, it was a curse. Uh, and uh, since they did have and do have a very skillful leader, uh, Mr. Soini, Timo Soini, who happens also to have an Irish connection, uh, he uh, was able to uh, gain support from various uh, groups, uh, very different groups, but groups uh, which uh, put all together did form his party. The party is not easy to define, for instance, on an axis uh, left-right. On some issues they are right, on some others they are left. And when he interviewed, uh, Mr. Soini uh, replied to a, an interviewer to the question, are you a rightist uh, populist or a left-wing populist? I am populist for everybody. Um, and, and that was an honest answer, that, uh, because he, he does identify himself as a populist. And in the party program, the word populist does appear. So they are not at all afraid of being identified to, to that group. They, of course, explain what populist means in their terms. Not very different from the American term of populist, as it was used about a century ago. Well... Among their ranks, there are three PhDs of the 39. Uh, there are two uh, uh, Lutheran ministers. There are a number of uh, small-time businessmen, three policemen, uh, one entertainer. Uh, uh, so really, it's not easy to say what group of your population they represent. The common thing for them is that, as politicians, they are rather unexperienced. Uh, of the 39, uh, less than 10 have previous parliamentary experience of any kind. The others have experience on a local level in, in municipal councils and the like. During last winter, something very unusual happened on the political scene in Finland. We have been... Uh, in the comparisons that uh, Transparent International makes about corruption, we have been the least corrupted or among the three least corrupted in the world for a very long time. And now, uh, about half a year ago, or somewhat earlier, it became obvious that a group of businessmen had formed some sort of a fund for funding uh, politicians of their own picking from the various parties. And they funded their, uh, their election campaigns. Then it became obvious that in their ranks there were some businessmen of, shall we say, questionable reputation. And uh, those businessmen also did have projects where political influence could come in handy. And this was blown up in the news media, media as a very big thing. People are unused to the idea of quid pro quo and uh, of funding of uh, elections. And therefore, uh, this, this really meant a great deal. It so happened that the Prime Minister's party, the Centre Party, was the chief beneficiary of, of these funds. And the Prime Minister himself uh, had also benefited, or rather his campaign, not his person, 
had benefited from, from the, this. And on the top of that, the Prime Minister, shall we say, um, led a personal life which was too often in, in the tabloids. And all this put together meant that his prestige uh, and his position became intolerable and be half a year before the elections he had to resign and left also his party. And uh, his uh, successor, uh, Madame Kiviniemi, uh, an experienced, reputable, good politician, was prime minister only for half a year and of course in half a year nobody can change the course. So the nation went to the polls in an atmosphere of an emerging new party, political corruption and so on. That of course compared with most European nations was nothing big, nothing big at all, but in our case it was. In the course uh, uh, of the election then, which went uh, smoothly and without any, any, anything uh, out of the ordinary, we, when watching TV, when the counting uh, was finished by before midnight on, on the election day, learned that 49 mandates went to the so-called true fence of the 200, everybody including they themselves, were surprised. Nobody had even thought of it being possible. Those who thought that they would uh, make inroads in a serious ways spoke of 25 or something like that, and that was 39. And then it became obvious for the center party, which had been uh, in the government, the leading party, that they were the great losers. They had lost uh, more than any other party. In, in that, and they had lost mainly to the so-called true Finns. Incidentally, true Finn is not a very good translation of their Finnish name. A more proper translation uh, would be basic Finn, that, because that's, that's what they claim, claim to be. They are, uh, as they themselves think, the original Finns. Now, uh, Negotiations after the election for forming a coalition government started and it was obvious that uh, the Centre Party, being the big loser, would not come in and that the, the winner, the true Finns, uh, would be member of a coalition. And negotiations started on that basis. But it was soon obvious that their program was incompatible with that of others, especially on European issues. And the big thing all the time was Portugal. Not Greece, it was Portugal, because uh, we had to make a decision on our participation in the po Portuguese bailout just before the elections. And therefore everything was concentrated on Portugal. But earlier on, it was already clear that in the Greek case, there has been some cooking of the books of uh, 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 state finance. And the fact that um, Greece was in trouble because of its own misconduct, that uh, uh, made the Trufin's message, these are all corrupt, we must not support them, kind of a thing went very well with the population. So this was some kind of a protest movement, a protest movement in a country where the GDP grows handsomely, more than 4% per year, where employment situation is improving steadily, where the public debt is well below the 60% limit, where the budget deficit is well below the 3%. In other words, uh, if you take these criteria, people should have been happy. The contrary was true, they were very unhappy very broadly, partly because of the reasons I gave you a moment ago, but also partly because of the fact that after the Lehman Brothers uh, crisis, uh, we did have a crisis of our own, and our GDP uh, sank by 8%, which of course had se serious repercussions for, for our um, economy and the employment situation. 
But things are improving now, but that message still didn't influence people's voting behavior. After all this, we may come back to the title of this speech, Are Finns True Europeans? Well, in a sense, we are even more so than before, because now we too have an anti-European party, like the rest of the countries <laughs> in Europe. So, so in, in that sense, yes. In all likelihood, a new government will be installed next week, and the true Finns will not be in that coalition. So, in that sense, uh, th that issue as a coalition partner is solved. But the issue that they still have 20% of the parliamentary seats will, of course, mean that they have indirect influence in the political life of the country, and uh, much will depend on how they behave. The party is not racist. Mr. Soini, the leader, has disciplined members of the party who have... Uh, made racist statements, and he very clearly steers clear of that. But of course there are, within its ranks, people who are not easily, uh, easily guided on, on matters of this kind. The Conservative Party will be the leading party in the new coalition, and the Conservative Party has a long and strong record as a pro-European party. The Social Democratic Party will be the junior member of the coalition, and they too have a very strong European records, record. It is only in Finland where it is possible also to have the Conservatives and the former Communists, or, or the League of the Left in the same coalition, but that's the way it looks like. So my conclusion on the, on the basis of all the, this is that we have had a political storm but it's not a hurricane. We, uh, we have, um, th this will have an impact upon our politics in the future, but it's not going to change the course in any dramatic way. What I would like to say in the end about the true fence is to paraphrase uh, Mark Twain when he was asked how he felt about Richard Wagner's music. It ain't as bad as it sounds. And the, the same, of course, is, is true also with the, of the true Finns. They ain't that bad. Thank you.